aware of the problems engendered by the rapid expansion of aviation travel. Some wondered why there was no radar on board the planes to warn the pilots of the collision. The reality of commercial operations lay far behind public expectations and assumptions. The Grand Canyon disaster brought many of these problems into the public spotlight for the first time. The result was increasing appropriations for radar coverage, development of flight data recorders, and the creation of a new independent federal agency, the Federal Avi Aviation Agency. So with the national significance of the disaster outlined, I'm, I'm now going to sort of turn to how the park managed this totally unexpected uh, tragedy occurrence in its uh, jurisdiction. This is how the United crash site on Chuar Butte appeared in the aftermath of the accident. Now you can see um, a lot of blackened area caused by the fuel. And uh, as, well, as I'll show in another picture, and you can kind of see here a little bit, the fires that broke, broke out after the impact sort of melted a lot of the, a lot of the plane. In fact, uh, one of the, there was a scenic pilot who first identified these sites in the canyon, and when he first sort of flew by, um, parts of the fus fuselage were still intact. Um, but when, when they returned to the sites a day later, it had pretty much been burned up by the, by the fires. <clears throat> and again, here's just two other pictures sort of dem demonstrating kind of the uh, devastation of the crash. And again, um, in this picture on your left, you can kind of see a lot of this aluminum has actually melted and sort of fused to the rock. And then here's a picture of the TWA site. Again, you can see a lot of charring uh, caused by, uh, by the fires. These pictures suggest some of the difficulties recovery crews face in retrieving and identifying victims. 29 passengers, half of the total, from the United flight, and just four victims from the TW, uh, TWA plane were ever identified. The recovery of victims from the remote crash sites was itself a historic operation involving Air Force and Army helicopters, as well as park rangers, Civil Aeronautics Board investigators, Coconino County officials, and mountain climbing teams from Colorado and Switzerland. Research so far suggests that this is one of the largest and most dangerous recovery operations ever attempted in a national park. 76 individual helicopter flights in turbulent winds and high temperatures were undertaken from July 1st to July 10th. And you can kind of see here, um, helicopter technology in the 1950s isn't what it was, what it is now. Um, these were pretty unstable aircraft, especially in the turbulent conditions below the rim. <clears throat> uh, this is an Army helicopter uh, recovering bodies at the uh, Chugar Butte site. Uh, they ultimately had to use helicopters to get into this area. Um, initially, they had these mountain climbing teams from Colorado and Switzerland trying to scale this thousand foot cliff face that the plane was on, but that was ultimately um, unsuccessful. Uh, they didn't feel they would, they felt it was too dangerous actually to use helicopters at first, but uh, eventually they were able to land and, and uh, continue with the recovery operation. Here's another picture from the uh, recovery operations at the United site. Uh, they had to use some sort of safety lines strung across this area because it's on a sort of a steep uh, slope. And they had to use those lines to um, make sure the operations were safe to recover bodies. So this is just kind of another photo to give you an idea of the conditions that they were dealing with. The difficulties in identifying bodies necessitated the construction of two mass graves, one in Flagstaff Citizen Cemetery for the TWA victims and the other, the other in Grand Canyon Cemetery for the unidentified United passengers. Uh, so here you can see the construction of the TW, TWA grave underway 
And uh, you can kind of see how it's oriented. One of the interesting things about this is it's sort of oriented towards the mountain. And uh, <clears throat> its location near this large pine tree was, was a conscious part of the design, overall design of the mass grave. This photo of the memorial service, which was held on July 9th, clearly shows, once again, sort of the, the dramatic vista that they were sort of trying to get in constructing this. <clears throat> uh, Howard Hughes, actually then president of uh, TWA, was personally involved in sort of the memorial uh, services and service and preparations for this. Flagstaff businesses actually closed um, downtown businesses closed, and a lot of residents here donated their cars to the funeral procession. <clears throat> Over 350 people actually attended this, and uh, there was a great deal of news coverage. They even had TV cameras here in Flagstaff to uh, cover the memorial service. As you can see, it's a pretty, uh, pretty dramatic scene. <clears throat> And this is actually shot from, um, you know, if you were a relative of one of these victims, they actually had a grandstand constructed. And this is the view from the grandstand, sort of looking towards the mountain. <clears throat> a similar service was held for the United Victims on August 2nd at Grand Canyon Cemetery near the South Rim. Uh, and you can see here they erected sort of this granite obelisk uh, monument over the mass grave there. However, the mass graves are not the only touchstones planned for the victims. Flagstaff radio host Charles Saunders began a fundraising campaign to erect a monument on the rim overlooking the crash sites. Saunders' campaign received the support of Arizona Governor Ernest McFarland, but Grand Canyon Superintendent John McLaughlin, <coughs> McLaughlin felt the monument would interfere with the ban on structures on the rim. McLaughlin tried to convince Saunders to settle for a small interpreter <coughs> marker instead of a monument, and to divert excess funds to the uh, construction of the Shrine of the Ages Chapel, which is un, uh, under construction. McLaughlin found an ally in Arizona Daily Sun publisher, Platt Klein, who also who wrote an editorial opposing the construction of a monument on the rim. Like McLaughlin, he argued that funds should be diverted to the chapel, which he viewed as a more useful and suitable memorial to the victims. By December, Saunders' efforts to construct a monument on the rim had stalled, and it appears the front funds he collected were instead used to purchase a plaque placed at the TWA mass grave. So uh, this is the plaque that it appears um, was purchased from funds that Saunders got gathered. What's interesting about this example uh, is that it gestures at the tension between memorializing the disaster and maintaining Grand Canyon as a monument to nature. Instead of a monument marking the location of the crash sites, a troubling proposition for the park and some members of the Flagstaff community, the mass graves became the focal, for focal point for public remembrance. In the days immediately following the disaster, park personnel were focused on assisting recovery operations. However, officials at Grand Canyon also demonstrated a concern for the visibility of the wreckage and its possible impact on visitors. As we have seen, the disaster left two large areas blackened and strewn with wreckage, but it was hoped that within a year, rain would wash away much of the charred soil and debris. During the recovery operation, Superintendent John McLaughlin Laughlin requested that any wreckage found within sight of the river be concealed and sent a reconnaissance party to survey the river below Char and, and Temple Butte. One ranger was assigned to a river tour that traveled past the scene in July. His primary objective was to assess the visibility of the wreckage from the river and remove debris such as empty body bags that had been left near the river by recovery crews. A series of incidents involving river travelers during the summer of 1957 confirmed fears that the wreckage would influence tourist activity. Although the wreckage area was closed to the public because of the ongoing accident investigation, river travelers put ashore in the restricted area. In May 1957, famed river guide Georgie White hiked into the TWA site and took pictures of the wreckage, which she aired on her TV show. 
When Superintendent McLaughlin heard about the pictures, he 